Throughout the centuries, there have been cities that fascinated the human mind and inspired its creative impulses. Cities that had a flavor all their own, attracting painters and poets, storytellers and musicians, and nourishing their imaginations. San Francisco is such a city. Begun as a Spanish mission and military settlement in 1776, it became a seaport city almost overnight when gold was discovered in the Sierra Hills in 1848. As the city grew, it retained and enriched its world-born traditions of tolerance, hospitality, and good living. With its wharfs and hills, its people from many lands, and its notable sophistication, it has held unceasing fascination for those to whom a great city well may be a lively, many-sided place of happy adventure, of beauty, and of inspiration. Have you ever experienced the astounding sight of San Francisco's cable cars? Elsewhere, means of transportation are prosaic utilities. But then, San Francisco is different. Its scenes and activities constantly reveal the unusual, the quaint, and the beautiful. No wonder that artists from all parts of the world have come to live and work in San Francisco. Many of them live on Telegraph Hill. Their colorful houses and flats perch like goats on the steep sides of the hill above the waterfront. This smiling Chinese worked as a houseboy and a cook only a few years ago. Now he is considered one of the finest watercolorists in America. Together with another painter, a young American of Greek descent, he walked down the hill to find a place suitable for sketching. The bay with its silvery span and ships from all the seas has always offered an exciting challenge to San Francisco painters. Dong attended art school at night, and to what he learned of Western technique, he added the secrets of brush drawing as they've been handed down among the Chinese through many centuries. The talents of many of the local artists have been employed to enrich the city with sculpture and wall decorations. Here at San Francisco's new junior college, a young painter and sculptor is finishing his mural for the school's foyer. Before the entrance to this modern functional school, he has already completed two huge heads in limestone. The American inventor, Thomas Edison, and the genius of the Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci. San Francisco City Administration, open-minded and art-conscious, has encouraged and sponsored many art projects throughout the city. At Aquatic Park, people marvel at the 5,000-square-foot mural painting depicting undersea flora and fauna. In the heart of Chinatown, we find Bufano's powerful stainless steel statue of Sun Yat-sen, China's George Washington. Even the gates of the city's realistic financial section have been crashed by art. Before the entrance to the stock exchange, dynamic figures of workmen and workwomen are cut in granite. Here, the artist has applied the earthy simplicity of Mayan art to modern themes. San Francisco is a city of spectacular surprises. Within a stone's throw of the busy downtown section, in a continuation of the very street we see, there is Sunday calm and stillness and the nostalgic atmosphere of bygone days. In the attics and upper stories of high-ceilinged, old-fashioned buildings, housing wine warehouses and small broom factories, studios have mushroomed, breaking with skylights into the monotony of black tarred roofs. Once this studio was a storage loft. When the artist first moved in years ago, spiders had spun elaborate webs and water leaked through the ceiling. The artist cleaned out the cobwebs, repaired the leaks, and filled the place with canvases and paint boxes, brushes and flasks. But otherwise, he left it as it was before. Of all places housing artists in the city, the Montgomery Block has the oldest tradition. 
Behind these barrack windows, George Sterling wrote some of his finest poems. Frank Norris wrote novels here, and so did Charles and Kathleen Norris. Once this massive building of brick and stone contained San Francisco's first law library. Once high-hatted, wax-mustached lawyers and stockbrokers had offices here. But in the 90s, artists began to move in. Now, probably more artists live in the Montgomery block than one could find living under any roof elsewhere in the country. The rent is low, there is romance of the building's past, and there is always another artist next door from whom to borrow a brush or some pastel. Not all are painters. Here is an industrial designer. A young sculptress, modeling in clay. An etcher running a copper plate through a heavy hand press. and examining the first trial proof. A metal worker soldering the blank for a ring. An artist who paints landscapes and street scenes from imagination and with drawn curtains. editor in the throes of producing a little magazine which circulates in the art colony. A young Chinese intently modeling the head of another member of San Francisco's Chinatown. studios, but big enough to accommodate a good-sized mural, such as this artist is designing for the San Francisco Press Club. There are other studios in San Francisco, studios with enormous skylights built according to the artist's own plans. Many of these are spacious and functional, striking combinations of the traditional atelier and modern ideas of design and layout. Some people seem to think of art in terms of smock and palette alone. Has it ever occurred to them that art makes its appearance as well in overalls and with a couple of buckets in its hands? Artists just don't sit around like in the second act of La Boheme. They have to be their own masons, their own stone cutters, yes, their own water boys. There is wide activity in advertising art in San Francisco, printing and publishing of the city's foremost industries. Some of the most accomplished artists working in commercial fields have their studios in San Francisco. Even here, where originality and creative expression are applied to strictly commercial jobs, art has not become dulled in routine, divorced from free individual expression. The stimulus of all that San Francisco is, is too strong for that. Sometimes, of course, the artists turn their studios into party settings, especially when they have visitors like their friend Henry Barnum Poor, Eastern painter and ceramist. They would not be artists if they didn't have parties, and they wouldn't be San Franciscans if they didn't show warm-hearted hospitality. One of the artists who has come to honor his eastern colleague is this sculptor. It was he who created Pacifica, theme decoration of the Golden Gate International Exposition on Treasure Island.
There is always somebody in his outdoor stone yard to sharpen tools or to discuss a new project. Nearly always you can find him here. In San Francisco, one can work out of doors all year round. It never gets too cold, and there is always a breeze from the ocean to cool the summer air. Twice a week, the sculptor comes to the art school to teach a younger generation the meaning and the technique of his art. Sprawling down one of the slopes of Russian Hill with spacious studios and gardens, the California School of Fine Arts is the second oldest art school in America. The very atmosphere of its location overlooking the Latin Quarter and the Bay is inspiring to young people in their study of the arts. The attraction of San Francisco, which has so much to offer in cosmopolitan spirit, in scenic excitement, and in the professional excellence of its major art school, brings many hundreds of art students every year from all parts of the country to the Golden Gate. Every branch of art is taught at the California School of Fine Arts. Figure painting and ceramics, fashion illustration and life drawing, interior decoration and lithography, sculpture and advertising art, metalwork and camouflage. And, of course, outdoor sketching, allowing the students to choose their own viewpoints and let their imaginations freely translate into sketches and paintings what appeals to them in their surroundings. The California School of Fine Arts, incidentally, is not the only art school in San Francisco. There are others specializing in advertising art, fashion design, and other allied arts. Few tools but skillful hands are needed to learn the secrets of an art which is as old as civilization. Pottery. Priced food is served at the cafeteria where scholarship students help behind the counter. Some eat their meals indoors against the background of murals painted by students themselves. Others take their trays to the sunlit patio. Here is the school's spacious library. Conducted along modern library principles, it contains hundreds of fine prints and color reproductions, current art publications, and valuable books on ancient and modern art. Affiliated with the University of California, the California School of Fine Arts has elected as its special function the training of those who want to go into commercial fields and who want to teach art. Still life painting develops the student's ability to dramatically arrange subject matter.
And here is our sculptor again, ready to assist students where they need an expert hand in shaping figures in clay from a model. For individual creative expression, and as a forceful medium for book illustration and commercial purposes, lithography is one of the many technical courses offered by the California School of Fine Arts. Expertly, the instructor gets a student stone ready for printing. First, he etches it. Then inks it, lays the paper on the stone, and prepares the stone to be rolled under the press. And here you are, young lady. It's a nice design, too. In 1930, the art school invited Diego Rivera, a great Mexican muralist, to paint this fresco, his first in the United States. So realistic is the painting of the artist on the scaffolding that at first glance, one might think it Rivera himself. Actually, it is but a life-size depiction of the artist. An announcement from the California Palace of the Legion of Honor intrigues these students they decide to drive out to that museum to see the masterwork of the month. A scenic drive along the Golden Gate leads them up to the California Palace of the Legion of Honor. The Legion is a museum primarily devoted to the fine arts, to paintings and sculptures by old masters. Serene in its quiet surrounding, it is a place of recollection, a post of the spirit, a cathedral of art. As we have studied in the past, a lecturer is discussing the masterwork of the month. And of course, Gainsborough, greatest of all English portraitists, immortalized in this painting the traits of a woman who had been closest and dearest to George IV of England. She was a commoner, Maria Fitzherbert, but in his final testament and will, the king called her the wife of my heart and soul. As you will notice in this painting, Gainborough has succeeded admirably. Aside from the English, the Dutch and the Flemish schools are particularly well represented at the Palace of the Legion of Honor. Among the museum's priceless treasures is a dramatic portrait of St. Peter by El Greco. To lovers of portraits by the old masters, the Legion offers a wealth of splendid examples. Art connoisseurs travel from afar to view the museum's fine collection of Rodin bronzes and marbles. Beautifully landscaped into Golden Gate Park is the De Young Memorial Museum, the city's oldest art institution. Perhaps the people in San Francisco are more art-minded than in other communities. Perhaps it is the excellence and variety of the material on display that attracts so many. In any event, 
San Francisco's de Young Museum boasts the largest attendance in relation to population of any museum in the United States. From a modest nucleus collection in 1895, it grew rapidly into an institution embracing in its galleries many thousands of priceless objects which provide a thrilling shortcut through centuries of mankind's creative effort. The de Young Memorial Museum is popular with the boys of the Army. They all stop at the gun room, which traces the development of weapons through the centuries up to the modern tank. You see, the de Young is essentially a people's museum. It is a family museum. It is the kind of place people enjoy in the way they enjoy stories of distant lands in bygone days. To stroll through these galleries does something to you. Time and space contract. If it weren't for the guards about, you could practically touch what by right belongs in other centuries and other parts of the globe. Sailors on furlough are fascinated by the old ship's lanterns, ship models, and nautical instruments. Occasionally, artistic merit is subordinated to historical significance, as in this throne chair of Napoleon. It is not art for art's sake that people see, hear, and enjoy. It is art as the expression of other peoples and other times. It makes them feel their kinship with the world. It stirs their aspiration for what is the essence of all civilization, the spiritual things that make life richer and more abundant. This rare old print shows the San Francisco City Hall, which burned down in the fire of 1906. Next to the sumptuous new City Hall in San Francisco Civic Center is the San Francisco Museum of Art, complementing the functions of the other two museums by stressing educational activities and the work of living artists. At the San Francisco Museum of Art, the display of from 12 to 15 new shows each month is usual. Some of the shows are arranged for locally, some are loan exhibitions from other art institutions of the country. New arrivals are carefully unpacked, like this painting of Mother and Child by the modern master Picasso. Checked combined with others from the museum's permanent collection, then taken up to the galleries for hanging. The San Francisco Museum of Art is a young museum. It is young in its preoccupation with contemporary art and its exploration of modern art and its sources. It is young in its manner of presenting exhibitions in a fresh and lively way, in providing explanations and demonstrations to explain them, and in its freedom from museum tradition and hampering policies. It is young by being experimental, exploratory, and active in all fields touching on art. Let's change it. Put it over here. All right. Looks like a good idea to me. All right. Let's see what happens here. You take that. One. There are so many educational activities at the San Francisco Museum that a person can actually find a different one for each of many nights, week after week, all through the year. 
To be of broadest possible service to working people who are usually unable to come in the daytime, the museum, only one in the country in this respect, is open free to the public every weeknight until 10 o'clock. Lectures, coordinated with current exhibitions, are effectively illustrated with slides and motion pictures. Children's classes on Saturday mornings are designed for all children regardless of artistic abilities. These classes provide a happy outlet for the youngster's imagination. Courses in flower arrangements are attended by many San Francisco women who look for new ideas for table decorations. But these courses have a deeper meaning, a challenge to good taste in design and color that lead many to a fresh understanding of the fundamental principles that underlie all art. At the museum's painting for pleasure class, everybody who wants to dabble is welcome. It is all handled in a very informal manner. There are plenty of paint and brushes and no questions asked. The class is open one night a week. You may come and go whenever you please. They all come, factory worker, longshoreman, stenographer, and even the tidy businessman. Would his office boy ever guess that he had always nursed a secret desire to be a painter of landscapes? Yes, he should make a note of that art show at the Ferry Building. It's open to everybody. And he won't have to pass a highbrow jury either to have his pictures exhibited. In the Ferry Building, decorated with gay banners, San Francisco's artists have hung their paintings. The thousands who wander through these spacious arcades react joyfully and spontaneously to the still lifes and landscapes, the pottery and small sculptures that have sprung from the imagination and skill of their artists. Here they find realization of their own dreams, projection of their hopes and aspirations. There is nothing fancy or formal about the show that is not wrapped in pomp or mystery. It is alive, young and dynamic, part of the people, part of the city that has inspired it, San Francisco.